we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, that we have the freedom and the, the, the technology in order to study your word together. We give you thanks for all who have studied revelation before us and who have, who have given us ideas and understanding to share. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us <coughs> and to open your wisdom for us. Bless us in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. According to... to, to um, my recollection and and my um, bookmark in my binder. Uh, we are starting chapter 17 today. Hello, Zenat. Hi, good morning. How are you, everybody? Good, good. And, um, and from my perspective, this is sort of the, the hump, as it were, that takes us into the glorious finish of the book, if I'm if I make sense, um, this is this is where we see God at work, or we begin to see God at work. We see the the worst that there is, and we suddenly realize that the worst is not beyond the ability of God to cope with. It is not beyond the ability for us to cope with, with God's grace and support and care. <coughs> so let's look at chapter 17. And would somebody like to read chapter 17 for us? Yes, we did. Okay, John. Let's see. Yeah, I'm on, right? Sound? Yes, you're on. I can hear yeah. you. So any particular translation? This is the translation according to John. Whatever you've got there in front of you. Um, okay. Yeah, because I could read a different one, but there's so many translations, but I'm sure you're familiar with this one. I think it's a new international. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Chapter 17, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulterers. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit <clears throat> into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and 10 horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished. 
when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. <clears throat> they are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is, the, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called chosen and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the 10 horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So far, the word of God. Thank you. <clears throat> in this section, in this chapter, are, are several interesting things. And I don't know whether you, you notice them as we were reading it or as you've looked at it. Um, one is a parody, a parody on the name of God. Did you pick that out as we were reading it? Cameron, do you want uh, to? Uh, uh, they see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Right. It was, is not, and is to come. So what's several times in already in the text we've had the the praise sung to god who was who is and who will be it's an interesting interesting parody and um so so we have the understanding of god who was god from the beginning is god now and will be god God right through to the end. And here we have this statement about one of these kings who was, who is not, and who will be. And can you think of, do you know enough, do you remember enough of your Roman history to know which emperor that, that that could refer to? Nero, who committed suicide. And there was the understanding among some people that, that Nero would return again. And, and so he was the emperor who was, who is not now, but according to, to some people's expectation, would, would return, would come back again. And so here the, the writer is, is, is um, teasing us with an idea and making a statement about, about these emperors who have declared themselves gods, who have been deified by the by the Roman culture. And you know, they are not, they were gods, 
but they're not the real God. They're not the God who was, who is, and who will be. And for, for the, the readers of this, particularly those who were seeped in, in the Old Testament scriptures, they would, they would see this, this parody and, and, and catch it and, and, um, and be, I think, gently encouraged and warmed by it. There's another very um, interesting reference there that people who understood the geography of, of Rome would have picked up right away. The seven heads are on seven hills on which the woman sits. And so here we have something that, that really identifies the woman as Rome. Do you remember your, your, your Roman history that Rome is built on seven hills? And so here we have it. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So obviously here, the writer is saying this woman who is the center of all of this abomination is Rome. And, um, you know, but saying it in a way that, that, that um, those in the know will pick out, those who are looking at it and reasonably educated, um, but not Christians, <laughs> might catch the illusion, but couldn't prove anything. And may I ask a question? Yes. Sorry to interject. I'm missing the part where he reappears then. So where it, Nero, Nero yeah. reappears. The understanding was amongst some, some people at the time right. was that Nero would return. Right. Um, but is and, this just saying that he will return? So, or is it just so you're saying it's just alluding to the principle of reincarnation? It's alluding to the principle to it's alluding to this superstition that people had okay. that Nero was going to come again. It's not stating that it's going to be. Um, got, got it. Thanks. But but it's it's you know hooking in so that people identify Nero as one of these. And um, so what we've got here is, is the symbol of, of, um, of evil, the great whore, the harlot, um, and the beast being, being Rome. And if we look at, at this, um, in Jeremiah chapter 51, and there's a lot of references in Jeremiah 51 um, that, that are picked out in here. So you might want to flip back and forth between 51 and and here in your text and in fact I should open mine to, to that because I'm going to refer to several of them um, I have the luxury of having three or four Bibles out on my desk at once here um, 51 13 where um, Jeremiah is prophesizing and, and linking up Babylon um, as the, as the uh, um, problem against the, the problems with Babylon. 
and in 13, you who live by mighty waters rich in treasure, your end has come, the thread of your life is cut. And at, in verse one we have, um, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. So this is a parallel to Babylon. But, you know, the writer is using Babylon as a symbol for Rome in order to, to say Rome and not, um, and not, and in order to say, in order to, to signify Babylon, but without saying it. Like in the Harry Potter series, um, where nobody sells, says Valdemort's name, they say, um, what is it they say? He who cannot be, who must not be named, mm -hmm. I guess it is. But they, you know, make reference to him. Or like some people have said in recent times, that man in the White House, rather than saying um, Trump. And um, <clears throat> so we've got it. This chapter pulls a whole lot of references out of Babylon, imagery and symbolism. Um, with her, the kings of earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Um, Rome is just for these people, for the, for the readers and for the writer, Rome is the current version of the evil, evil cities or kingdoms that have permeated history. But Rome is the one that they're uh, concerned with. Um, in chapter, in verse three, we have, we have references taking us back to Revelation chapter 12, verse three, talking about the beast. And now we have the beast, um, covered with blas blasphemous names. It had seven heads and 10 horns. Um, Bernard uh, Clogg in his commentary suggests that the names, the blasphemous names are the names of the deified emperors who are were worshiped by Rome. And so these would, could be numbered up to 10, clearly numbered seven, but could be numbered up to 10. So you've got the seven heads and the 10 horns. And there are people, and in one of my commentaries, it contains a list of all of the um, emperors who could be referred to in this section. The woman is dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. And so obviously this is a reference to, to the imperial court and all of the, the ostentatious wealth of the imperial court. Um, apparently, verse five, that this title was written on her forehead. Um, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Apparently, the, the prostitutes in Rome that were connected with the various temples um, wore the name of the temple they were associated with or the god they were associated with on their crown or their, 
their headscarf or whatever it was. And um, so this is just another um, indication that, that um, this harlot is clearly wrong. And then um, the reference in verse six, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And so accusing Rome again of, of the persecution and martyrdom. Um, and particularly, probably particularly the um, persecutions of Nero, of Nero's time. If we go to verse eight, the, we've already talked a little bit about it. Um, and I've talked with you about Nero. Um, and this divine name is in Roman, in Revelation chapter one, verse four, and it comes from Exodus three, verse 14, who was, who is, and who shall be. Um, We move down to, to verse 10. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. So we've got Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, and Titus in that list. Um, and one of the commentators suggests that because um, uh, one is and the other has yet to come, was this written during the reign of Ves Vespasian, Vespasian, 68 to, six to 79, with reference to Titus as coming, being imminent? Um, it's usually thought of as being written around 90 AD. But, you know, some scholars do have little theories about, well, when could it have been written? Um, verse 11 is reference to, to uh, Nero. And um, then let's move on. Um, I don't have a lot of notes for this section, um, except if we move down um, to verse 13 and 14. Um, the writer is saying basically that all of the evil in the world has one purpose and they're using all of their power and the authority of the beast for one purpose and that is to make war against the lamb, to, against Jesus Christ. But the lamb will overcome. And that's the great promise. The great promise of the whole book, the lamb will overcome. And the lamb will overcome because he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, which is a really Old Testament title that appears a number of times in, in the Psalms and in Deuteronomy and in Daniel and in several other places, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And at a time when people were exposed to a whole lot of other gods all around them, they were willing to say to other people, yes, you can have your gods, but you have to remember this. Our God is the Lord of all lords, 
the king of all kings, the God of all gods. And I think that's an important thing to, to, uh, for us to remember. And I don't know about um, concepts of, of kingship, of monarchy in um, other traditions. But in the coronation of the of the British king, the monarch is presented with the orb, which is a gold sphere with a cross mounted on the top of it. And reminded that he or she is under the the authority of the king of kings, which is a very interesting, interesting concept that, um, you know, in the monarchy, the, the monarch's um, authority is derived from God. And ultimately, she, in our case now, she has her ultimate answerability and responsibility to God. And so here we have the understanding that God is going to be the ultimate victor over all of this that's happening. And um, the chapter concludes very succinctly with an understanding that ultimately um, the beast is going to be defeated and everybody will come to, to an understanding and will leave the the prostitute and leave her in ruins and leave her naked. And we saw something like this um, uh, last week. The number of people who over the last couple of weeks who left the Trump administration and resigned. They could see what was going to happen politically and they became disenchanted with all of the games that were being played and the number of his cabinet ministers and advisors, et cetera, who resigned. It's the same sort of understanding, isn't it, right there in the end of that chapter. And so here we have the evidence um, of the beginning of the end. Let's look now at chapter 18. I'd like to get through chapter 18. And if we can get, get into chapter 19, although I, depends how, how caught I get up in, in what we're talking about. Let's look at chapter 18. Somebody like to read chapter 18 for us. I will. Okay, Sarah. Take a turn. <clears throat> After all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. He gave a mighty shout, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. She has become a den of demons, a haunt of devils and every kind of evil spirit. For all the nations have drunk the fatal wine of her intense immorality. The rulers of earth have enjoyed themselves with her and businessmen throughout the world have grown rich from all her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven and God is ready to judge her for her crimes. Do to her as she has done to you and more. Give double penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed many a cup of woe for others. Give twice as much to her. She has lived in luxury and pleasure. 
match it now with torments and with sorrows. She boasts, I am queen upon my throne. I'm no helpless widow. I will not experience sorrow. Therefore, the sorrows of death and mourning and famine shall overtake her in a single day, and she shall be utterly consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. And the world leaders who took part in her immoral acts and enjoyed her favors will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand far off, trembling with fear and crying out, Alas, Bible on that mighty city, in one moment her judgment fell. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She was their biggest customer for gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, finest linens, purple silks, and scarlet, and every kind of perfumed wood and ivory goods and most expensive wooden carvings and brass and iron and marble and spices and perfume and incense, ointment and frankincense, wine, olive oil and fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots and slaves, and even the souls of men. All the fancy things you loved so much are gone, they cry. The dainty luxuries and splendor that you prize so much will never be yours again. They are gone forever. And so the merchants who have become wealthy by selling her these things shall stand at a distance, fearing danger to themselves, weeping and crying. Alas, that great city, so beautiful, like a woman clothed in finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one moment, all the wealth of that city is gone. And all the ship owners and captains of the merchant ships and crews will stand a long way off, crying as they watch the smoke ascend and saying, where in the world is there another city such as this? And they will throw dust on their heads in their sorrow and say, alas, alas, for that great city. She made us all rich from her great wealth, and now in a single hour all is gone. But you, O oh heaven, rejoice over her fate. And you, O oh children of God and the prophets and the apostles, for at last God has given judgments against her for you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder shaped like a millstone and threw it into the ocean and shouted, Babylon, that great city shall be thrown away as I have thrown away this stone and she shall disappear forever. Never again will the sound of music be there. No more pianos, saxophones and trumpets. No industry of any kind will ever again exist there, and there will be no more milling of the grain. Dark, dark will be her nights. Not even a lamp in a window will ever be seen again. No more joyous wedding bells and happy voices of the bridegrooms and the brides. Her businessmen were known around the world, and she deceived all nations with her sorceries. And she was responsible for the blood of all the martyred prophets and the saints. Thank you, Sarah. An interesting passage. And that's quite a, a modern translation that you're reading from, Sarah. And um, I like the, the, the way the, the translator has, has talked about businessmen, because I think it makes it so real and present for us today. So this is, this is the forecast of the fall of Rome and all that, that's, that's going to accompany this fall of Rome. And it's not only going to be, be a, a, um, a destruction of Rome, but it's also going to have consequences all across the society. And um, it's going to touch all of the people who have benefited from, from the, the power and the splendor and the atrocities of Rome. Um, where shall we start with all of this? I think the, one of the things that, that 
that the readers of the time, the Christian readers, would want to have to see and would be so um, gratified is the simple statement here. Um, for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. There's a sense here of vindication, isn't there, for the, for the victim. And that is what, what some of the Christians were hoping for. They were hoping that, you know, the, all that they've suffered wasn't going to be forgotten. And I think that's, that's a perfectly natural um, thing. We don't want the plight of... of <laughs> of the victims to be to be forgotten. We don't want the plight of the persecuted to be forgotten when things have changed. And there's this great call from heaven. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Come out. And this is a great call for us as Christians, for the Christians of the time to come out of the culture, for us as Christians today to come out of the, of the destructive, immoral <coughs> parts of our culture, to separate ourselves from them. And... Um, you know, we have this similar call to come out in, in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 45, verses 6 and 9, in Isaiah 48, verse 20, and even in Mark chapter 13, we have a similar statement. Mark 13, verse 14. But when you see the, um, desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Someone on the housetop must not go down or enter the house to take anything away. Someone in the field must not turn back to get a coat. And so when, and this passage from uh, chapter 13 is all about the destruction of Jerusalem, where Jesus is forecasting the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, the desolating sacrilege is setting up the Roman symbols inside the temple. And when you see that, flee. Get away from there. And of course, it was important for the, for the Christians to flee at the beginning of that, because all of those who were caught up in Jerusalem ultimately were, were, were murdered um, by the Romans as they destroyed Jerusalem completely. So this calling to come out from the evil place and you know different times in history we've had the same call to come out um i can remember going to a billy graham school of evangelism week in halifax and we had um norma and i had had um uh, arranged accommodation at um, at the base, at Base Halifax in, in quarters. But a lot of the people had arranged accommodation in the hotel where they um, where the conference was being held. And 
the week before the Billy Graham Association discovered that the hotel in Halifax was also where the casino was. At that time, the, the Halifax casino was in, in a major hotel in Halifax. And when they discovered that, they quickly changed the location of the um, conference to another hotel and um, were able to arrange for most of the people to move out of that hotel as well. Um, because the Billy Graham Association did not wish to be associated with a gambling casino. And um, it, was, it was made quite a statement of written up in the newspaper and, and you know, a great fuss was made over it. And the hotel threatened to uh, sue the Billy Graham Association. And they just said, you know, we, we have a standard. And if you had told us that this was part of your um, organization, we wouldn't have contacted you to begin with. And so this is the idea, you know, move away from, from where the sin is. And, you know, there's going to be some some vindication um, that people are going to get paid back. Rome is going to get paid back in verse six. And we have statements of this in, in Jeremiah 50, 29 and Psalm 137 verse eight as well the idea of vindication and payback um, or punishment. Now let's look on at verses nine um, uh, and following. And um, Verses nine and 10 um, make reference to the other kings of the earth who sided with Rome are going to see the smoke of her burning and will mourn over her and will be terrified at her torment. And I just make a, a, a side comment about this um, very often when one of the um, uh, dictators in, in some part of the world um, has a comeuppance and is, is upset by a popular movement, there are a whole lot of other dictators who, who mourn and, and uh, take note of what's happened and um, have some trepidation about their own um, potential comeuppance. And we saw that in the, the Arab Spring several years ago when um, several countries had sudden changes of government by the popular authorities. And unfortunately, more tyrants just took over from that in most places. But, you know, I think um, what happens is that um, those who have been in league with and benefited from one authoritarian um, leader um, become, uh, become concerned about their own status when that leader falls. Now look at the Verse, verses 11 through to, um, well, verses 11 through to the end, I guess. Um, nearly to the end. 11 through to, yes, I guess it's pretty well the end. And what we're talking about here are, are 
is the economics of change. What's going to happen to the economy when all of this change happens, when all of this destruction happens? And you know, there are a whole lot of people who benefit from, from the lifestyle that goes with decadence. And those are going to be people who will, who will um, feel the peril and feel the pinch um, when that decadent lifestyle suddenly collapses. And so the merchants are, have grown rich over supplying things. And now they are going to be stuck with all of this merchandise and no markets for it. I find it interesting though, if you look through all of this list in verses 11, uh, 12 and 13, if you look through that list of all these things, they're all consumer goods. They're all high-end consumer goods. And they bring prosperity because somebody wants them, not because somebody needs them. If you notice that. Um, some of you know that I, I um, like to make furniture and that I study furniture as well. And um, one of the interesting things I read recently in one of my, the articles is that um, there is a prejudice or a bias in museums for high-end furniture. And the furniture that we have from previous periods of time that we have preserved and that museum historians and curators work to preserve are all the high-end furniture, not the ordinary furniture. And of course, that's because they, they were perceived as being quality pieces. It's because they um, were, were made out of very exotic woods. They were expensive and valuable. And um, they generally couldn't be remade into something else. The ordinary furniture that was in ordinary houses Um, when it was finished, when people were fed up with it, or it was damaged or whatever, rather than repair it, uh, they might have reused the material for something else. Or if they couldn't reuse it, uh, they burnt it because surplus wood was fuel to keep them warm. And um, so the ordinary things, the things that the ordinary people use, we don't have as many copies of as, and as many um, preserved historical items as, as some of the very high-end stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the same sort of thing here. This is all high-end consumer stuff that's being preserved that's being sold and the, the basis of the wealth of these merchants. And I'd like you to contrast that with Deuteronomy chapter eight. For those of you who have, have gone through um, Thanksgiving services for a few years, um, let's say over a period of 10 years or so, 
you will have been exposed to Deuteronomy chapter eight um, at least three times over a 10 year period, um, probably more depending on, on where your, your minister pulled his lessons from. But Deuteronomy chapter eight talks about the blessings of the promised land. I will take, I take you into a land flowing with milk and honey where you will lack nothing, where stone, your, the stones are iron and from whose hills you can dig copper. And actually it goes on and lists the things. The promised land contains the things that the country, the people are going to need. And Deuteronomy, well, the entrance into the promised land occurred just at the time of transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. And I think it's really interesting that the Bible records both copper and iron as being available in the promised land. So what land God is giving to the Israelite people as their promised inheritance is a land that has copper for bronze, so that it has the current technology, and it has iron, which is just beginning to come in. So God is giving them the things they need. God will bless us with the things we need. These merchants are going to be caught with all of the luxury items. Their wealth is based not on the things that people need, but on luxury items for luxury society. And luxury society is going to collapse. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. And so even the... <laughs> Not just the merchants, the businessmen, but the sea captains and the sailors are all going to, to go into mourning because of the destruction of Rome. And, you know, this just um, ties in with, with several other things that we know about the Roman Empire. There's that old saying, all roads lead to Rome. And the highway, the Roman road system, and the Romans were fantastic at building roads. And the Roman road systems all connected ultimately to Rome. You could walk on a Roman road from York in England all the way through Europe to Rome. Or you could walk on a Roman road from Damascus all the way through the Middle East to, to Rome. You could also take Roman ships anywhere and everywhere, from anywhere to Rome or anywhere else in the Roman Empire. Um, and, and um, so these statements here just give you an idea of, of how much wealth came to Rome through, through the roads and through the ships. Rome, was, Rome could not feed itself, could not meet its own needs, and relied upon imports. And we have that same economic... Um, uh, situation today where there are a lot of countries that have to rely on, on imports and have one sole export and are not self-sufficient. So then we have um, this last set of images in chapter 18. 
millstone, the large millstone. And we have the parallel passages in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, particularly 51, 59 to 63, 64, with the idea of, of the evil being picked up and thrown into the sea. Um, we also have that in the Gospels, where Jesus says, if, if you're high-handed in your sins, it, you might as well be picked up and, and thrown into the sea with a millstone. And one of the things about a millstone is the millstone represented um, wealth or the means of producing wealth or the means of producing what you needed. So to destroy a millstone was to bring hardship on a community. And it was like, um, well, like during the Second World War, when the bombing raids sought to destroy the factories of the enemy country. You know, the bombing in Britain was on air, airplane factories and truck factories and armament factories and the bombings, the British bombings of, or the allied bombings of, of Germany were in the Ruhr Valley where all the industries were. So you, you sought to destroy the industries which produced the wealth and produced the necessities for people. Well, to destroy a millstone was to take away from a community or a society the ability to grind their corn and to make their food. An interesting concept to think about, isn't it? Um, Okay, I'm going to finish there. It's just 12 o'clock. If you want to turn your, your microphones on again, and is there any questions, anything that you want me to, to go over with, with more depth? Um, any comments? Have either been very clear or or so muddy that um, nobody wants to wade into the mire that I've created. Thanks, Donald, for your gift of yeah, knowledge or expertise or insight in relaying some of these thoughts. I've read it many, well, read many times, but always lots of questions, but to bring it to what it really Looks like it means, yeah, brings it more home. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciated your note, Donald, about the sort of, I had not sort of thought of it before, first reading it through about the, um, the type of, of goods that are mentioned. Like that was a, yeah. an interesting thing to ponder and then connecting that to Deuteronomy. So something for myself to, reflect on so thank you it is helpful to have the um cross references to the other uh books as well yes there's so much interconnection and i i really think that helps us to understand things um in a better way when we when we see the connections back and forth and follow them. The ideas that, that John's presenting don't come out of nowhere. And you know, whenever we whenever we are are, are adapting or doing theology, whenever we're doing theology to 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 communicate our our Christian faith to a new situation in our society. 
what we're doing has to come from somewhere. And, and uh, so the roots of our, of our Christian response to anything come out of the depth of our Christian faith. And I think that's important for us to, to, to understand. And that's why I, I like to do that back and forth that way. Um, yes, okay. Anything else in there? Thank you, Ben. No? Okay, well, let's let's go to to our BAS and to to our noonday prayers then. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. O oh God, the source of all life, you have filled the earth with beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I'm just going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 for our lessons today. Chapter 8, beginning at verse 6. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you will eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to strengthen us in all the tensions and challenges of life, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we bring before God our concerns for our world. We pray for God's gift of wisdom to those who are in leadership positions in our own country, in the United States, in our world. We pray for those who are dealing with illness. We pray for those who are discouraged and concerned. We pray for our families. All these prayers, O oh Lord, we bring to you In the words your Son, our Savior, has taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>